Hi, I'm Dr. Zebun Nasreen Ahmed, and this is the story that I'd like to get inked. So we were middle class, but again, at the same time, we were not, you know, uh, we had a good standing in society, but we were not, uh, you know, very rich or we didn't have um, you know, uh, un, uh, um, unlimited wealth or anything like that. My father was a Navy officer. So obviously, we had a good standing in society. I was born in, out of the country. I was born in London. So um, I never had the chance to live in Bangladesh during my childhood. The first time I came to live in Bangladesh was when I was 16 years old. And, and so my studies, everything was abroad. I never studied in Bangladesh until I entered Buet, which was when I was, um, I entered Buet when I was 17 years old because I had studied very fast and, and I was accepted through the proper channels into Buet. So I was almost not exposed to the sort of you know, climate, the sort of prejudices, the sort of um, uh, culture that is of Bangladesh. But at the same time, so when, when did I come to Bangladesh? This was in the mid 70s. I started Buet in 1975. So I'm, you know, pretty ancient. And I came from a different background and I'm coming to Bangladesh to see this uh, to fit in to this new situation, completely different. The media of education was English, no problem. Getting into Buet was no problem at all. What I want to emphasize here is that in those early years of my formation, I have never been exposed to anything, any gender issues or any uh, issues about, you know, class a lot, not a lot, because, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, we just in England, where I was, uh, I studied for some time, and in Pakistan, where I studied for some time, we never had to face uh, uh, this sort of thing uh, at all. No gender issues at all. So I was brought up, up just like any. Uh, I never thought, am I a boy or am I a girl? Nothing like that. Never. But now I'm 17, 16, and plus. When I came to Bangladesh and now I'm 17, I'm entering Buet. Suddenly, I realized that other people are different. All the people around me have come up in a different sort of a situation where uh, the women are treated different from the men. The boys are treated different from the girls. The boys are the privileged. If you have a girl in your family, then, uh, you know, it's so sad. Okay, maybe next time. It's like that. My parents faced that, but my parents never let me feel this. Also, the gap between the rich and poor was not at all there. So this was the in 1970 onwards, the 70s in Bangladesh was like that. But I still feel that that time was slightly more, um, um, what do you call it, more... Um, enlightened, I would say, than the present. People are now very, very conservative. But at that time, these conservative things hadn't really entered society, I feel. Maybe it's my, uh, you know, my outlook when I was a young person, I didn't feel that sort of thing. Maybe people hadn't talked to me about it. Maybe I hadn't been exposed to it, but that's the way it was. While I was in Buet, it was fine. Because once you enter Buet, you enter a system and there is you cannot differentiate between boys and girls there. All you have to do is you have to perform well and you do well. If you don't perform well, you, uh, it's reflected in your grades and everything. So I got, I was, I did very well in Buet. Uh, it, it didn't affect me at all. You know, whatever the Bangladesh situation was about gender, about class, didn't affect me at all. So this was fine. 
1981, I passed out of WIT, one of the top, topping in the class, so I deserved a, uh, you know, a job at WIT teaching. I was very happy about that. So I went for the interview, rejected. Rejected in favor of a guy with worse result than me. In WIT, this never happens. So I thought that, okay, maybe I did a bad interview. The next year when they went for the interview again, I sat again. Again, I was rejected. Again, in favor of a guy with a worse result than me. Okay. I was so sad. I was so sad. Um, but I took it. I took it. Well, I asked, uh, okay. So, and by this time, I was married while I was in Buet. So by this time, my husband was going for his PhD in England. So I went with him and I did a master's degree. My MPhil, my master in philosophy was during that time. I did it. I had a child. I worked. I had my child and I studied and I did all the housework and I got my degree. I was so happy. We came back to Bangladesh. I sat for my interview. Now I have my MPhil my BR and all the good results, of course. I sat, again, I was rejected in favor of a guy, again, with not up to my standard yet. So this time, finally, I got up, you know, my um, confidence and I went to one of the interviewers, the head of the department and asked him, why was I rejected? every time. So they said, oh, it's simple, we needed a man. It was so blatant at that time. They didn't even feel bad about talking about this. They needed a man, so they rejected me, despite my, um, you know, everything, all my um, achievements. It's, it was so sad. This is where, so I'm saying that I had no control over all this. I did my best wherever I could, but I had no control over the extraneous things that, would, that happened to me. So after seven years, finally, the fourth time I sat for my interview, I was taken in. Seven years junior to the person who was just, uh, who was taken in with me probably, you know. So this uh, gender issue, while it didn't affect me at all during my board studies, it definitely affected me afterwards. Luckily for me, the place where I got my employment, that is Buet, once you get into the system again, you can't stop the system. You can't say, oh, she's a woman, she's a man, he's a man, yeah, so it's going to be, happen like this. No. At that time, I got into the system, and then it was my merit, it was my um, you know, work, my effort, my teaching that helped me on. And by within five years, I was once again, topping all the people who had come before me, luckily. In fact, it's a sort of an irony that ultimately this institution who rejected me thrice, ultimately when in 2016, four years ago, when our vice chancellor, who was an excellent lady, Professor Khalid Ekram, when she died, the government appointed me as acting vice chancellor for instead in her place because she had died and that I served in that position. So it's an irony of fate that four times rejected, three times rejected person finally gets to head the institution. <laughs> so gender, yes, gender has put me down to a certain extent in those seven years. But at the same time, it, does, it didn't matter in the long run when you look when you uh, keep on at it and if you go on at it if you plod on if you are determined it won't matter you shouldn't think, get things to pull you down okay so that was one question that was one uh, you know look at my story so uh, um, I'll just look into that I'll go to the, my, the next part of my thing. Okay. 
if I look at the, uh, now I'll talk about who's been my inspiration. I have to talk about my parents. My mother was, you know, I cannot uh, explain to you what a wonderful woman she was. She was the most kind hearted, most generous woman. She was a housewife completely, but she was educated and she used to read all the time. It didn't matter that she was a housewife. While we were children, she did her um, master's in history. And she used to give us tasks every day when we were children. We used to have, uh, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I used to have a task every day to read up on something and write a paragraph about it every day. I and my elder sister used to do this. So we had the chance to you know, enrich our knowledge outside our um, you know, basic academic uh, stuff, whatever it is. So that was a very good thing. Uh, and she was a, such an honest person, I just can't believe it. My father tells me a story quite often of how once when they were young, they were just married and my mother and my father were going in a rickshaw to my, uh, some friend's house. And um, you know, they were late because my father had overslept or something. And so my father said to my mother during the rickshaw ride that, uh, you know, uh, when we go there, we'll say that I was, uh, I was very busy and so I couldn't make it. Don't tell them about my oversleeping. And my mother was quiet. She said nothing for a while. And then my father realized that, well, she doesn't seem to be in a good mood. What's happened? So he said that, what's wrong with you? She said, you know, I hate lying. So he said, "What? What? Because it was a white lie." So he didn't even it didn't even register in him that he had talked about this lying thing. So he said, "What lying? I, I we're not lying anywhere. Have I lied? In, uh, did I lie to you?" He said, "Yes. If you tell them that you overslept, it's a lie." And my father tells me now that that uh, lesson changed him. That instant changed him so much that he became a, an honest man for his forever and ever. Not only didn't he ever cheat anybody, but he never even told a white lie. At least he tried not to. When he said that, when he says that he never said a white lie, he again said that I tried because in case that's a white lie. So he, uh, and so if I come to my father, my father is, Alhamdulillah, he's 94 He's going to be 94 in October. He's well, he's a man of great determination. He says that he's not meritorious, but he's a man who does a lot. He says it's 95% uh, perseverance and 5% intelligence. He says, I'm not intelligent, I'm perseverant. And so he continuously works, continuously does things. He's still working and he, um, he is a person who told me at, you know, at my early age, this was before I had started university, I think. And he said, you know what you should do? You should read at least 30 pages every day, 30 pages of uh, something, some, um, uh, something which is outside your actual profession, something that is not related to it. Read on philosophy, read on history, on popular science, on even real science, if you want, on mathematics, whatever. But read 30 pages, and by the end of, say, one month, you've read a thousand, almost a thousand pages, 900 pages. That, you're that much more knowledgeable. At the end of the year, how much more knowledgeable are you? I'm not going to do the math. And uh, 10 years, and it's now 30 years or maybe 40 years since he told me that, how much more knowledgeable would I be? So I have to be honest with you. I didn't read 30 pages every day, but I definitely did read every day a lot. And a lot of it, uh, he didn't tell me about novels, about literature, but I've read so much of fiction. And this, I think, is something that gives me a lot of pleasure, but it also is very helpful. The way, when we read fiction, we realize things that don't happen to us, but it could. We, in this little life of ours, we cannot confront all the problems in life. We cannot, uh, you know, we'll never get a lot of the situations that happen to people, but reading about them will make us empathetic to 
other people's feelings. And this alone has helped me so much during my teaching career that I cannot tell you. And I think that this is, if I were to, you know, isolate one thing in my life that has changed me for the better, it is my fictional reading. Uh, amazing, because when I was a young person, when I was in school, you know, I used to read my books, and my, underneath my book was my fiction, because in case my somebody came along, my teacher in school, class, or my parents in my uh, at home, and said, you're not reading? Okay, so you have this much detention, so you, I'll have to read so much of uh, this. I wanted to avoid that, uh, and uh, I, I read my fiction. And it's so uh, ironic, isn't it, that that fiction, in fact, is what I think has made my teaching a pleasure. You were saying at the beginning of your talk that how pleasurable your work is. I can't tell you how lucky I am that I have been able to be a teacher because that's, that, I think, is one of the, you know, it, it's a blessing to be able to talk to people, to... Even when I talk to, say, 50 students and I see the spark of, you know, understanding in the eyes of two people, I feel that I've been blessed today. I feel that I've made a difference. If I can make the diff a difference in even, uh, you know, of one person's life, I think I've succeeded. And I hope that I can say that. I don't know because at the end of the day, uh, life will uh, speak for itself. But I want to believe it at the bottom of my heart that I do try to make a difference. That's my effort. Okay, so that, these are, that, that was my inspiration. That was what helped me. Um, if I talk to my students, I always tell them that um, uh, you will be faced with a lot of things in life. This is outside when I'm teaching. When I'm teaching, even then, I think that as a teacher, it is also our duty to tell them about life because they, uh, you know, whatever it is, as a teacher, they look up to you. They think that you know all the answers, though you don't, but they do think that. So I do try to talk about life to them. I talk about ethics a lot because I don't want my students to go out into the world and be unethical. I don't want them to be cheats or uh, things like that. I, at least I want to say that, that I want to feel that I had talked to them about it, even when, even if they do turn out to be unethical, I want to feel that I did try. Okay, so what I tell them is that your life will be faced with lots of challenges. Don't think of them as negatives. Always learn from your challenges. Always. This, I, even before um, I was rejected three times for Buet, uh, I lost a year in my Buet studies. And I'll tell you why. I became ill in, after giving my fourth year exam. We have a final year, we have a fifth year in architecture. So after giving my fourth year exam, I fell very, very ill, actually during the exam. So I fell very, very ill and I was hospitalized. And so uh, it was a, a bad time in my life. And ultimately, I had to, I, I couldn't continue with my fifth year classmates. So I dropped out of the class. I said that I can't continue with my classes because I was doing very well in my class. So, and uh, in where the system is that they can count all your extra mark, uh, back marks, and then they'll count my present marks. And that would be my result. I wanted to make a good result. So I wanted my back marks to count and not my you know if I'm going to be ill for half the year I won't be able to do a good result so I said that okay I'm not going to stick with the, these people I'll sit with the next people no bad results for me so that's what I did but when I look back at that year of mine that I sat back um, many people thought oh my god you must be having a nervous big breakdown you know topping were you know not being able to continue you, you've been doing so well and I saw that that was the year that actually made a lot of difference in my life. I'm very um, um, uh, religious in a way. I look at things spirit, uh, in a spiritual manner. I think that that was the year that formed me. You know, I got so much time to question, to question life, 
to question things. And I looked into the Quran, into religious studies, into a lot of studies, not only the Quran. I also looked into other religions. And I found so much. It's not only the Quran that makes me feel good about God. I, whenever I read other religions also, I love it because I feel that it, you know, it sort of resonates with what I feel. So that was, so I never thought of that as a negative. So when I say that don't feel that something, um, you know, when, when a negative thing has come to, into your life, don't treat it negatively. Sit, sit down, think, think positively and try to extract what you can from it. And that will help you. When I finished my um, studies and I was rejected the three times that I talked about, what happened? It gave me the opportunity to go with my husband to do my MPhil. What happened? I could have two children in the meantime. I had my first child during my, uh, you know, I was expecting during my VR, but really I could bring the, I, I, I had my second child during my master's. And so, I had that opportunity. I had the opportunity to get on with my life, to get on with, uh, on a good footing with my husband, and also to read and read and read. And you know what happened? This master of philosophy helped me to, I said that in about five or six years, I had already talked all those people who had been rejected in favor of me because of my MPhil. This MPhil helped me. Because whenever they were doing this reckoning on who's higher, Whenever they thought, oh, she's got an MPhil, okay, she gets these so much many more points. She's got so many uh, papers, okay, she gets so many points. How do I have those papers? Because of my training. That's it. So these seven years that I spent out of work between the, my graduation and my job actually helped me. When I look back at those years, I think that had those years not been there, I would have been a different me. You wouldn't have had me, Dr. Zabun Nasri Ahmed, uh, this, uh, you know, expert in uh, uh, sustainable design. No, you'd have me maybe, okay, she's starting to do research in this and yeah, she's done some research, things like that. Uh, so what, it, it helped me. Um, so life is like that. Uh, three years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. That was again a big, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, how can I call it? It was a, a shock. These things happen to other people. You don't expect cancer to come and, uh, you know, it hit you, your life. Here it was hitting me. And I was given, you know, I, I could be dying in a few days, in a few months. I may not be seeing the next year or so. How do I cope with that? all my training, all these years of, you know, reflection of looking at life in the way I had helped me. The first thing I did was I thought that what God has given me is for a purpose. If I'm being given cancer, it is also for a purpose. And that helped me a lot. As I started looking, I started reading more. I started, uh, you know, reflecting on life. I think it made me a more empathetic person. I hope so. What I didn't do was I didn't take a leave. I said that, no, I have to continue with my work. Because if I take a leave, I might become depressed. I might, you know, stop working. And I might think, oh, no, uh, you know, I'm going to die. Oh, what's, what's the point of life? I give up. I didn't do that. I actually supervised all my master's students, they did, they all got their master's um, level. I started supervising PhD students. I wrote many papers. In fact, in, during that time, I was invited thrice as keynote speaker to India, and I went. And, uh, and of course, I did a lot of uh, work in Vuet also. So I was, I felt so good. And this was while I was have, being treated for cancer. I had 22 um, chemotherapy sessions <laughs> and I did it all during this time. I, Alhamdulillah, I'm now uh, uh, a year and a half uh, cancer free. Uh, I became interested, as, a, as I said, in 1984 I started my MPhil and the subject was 
climate and how it responds to how how buildings actually respond to climate because we all build in different climates right and it's when i look at it when i well at that time it was climate but now when i look at it say in the last 10 years or so i've looked at it in terms of sustainability more than just the climate because sustainability actually takes into account people it's not only climate it's the context it is how people react uh, in fact sustainability has its three parts you know one part is environment but one part is economy which is the people and one part is equity which is more people and so if we look at the the three e's of sustainability it is more about people than about climate of course i talk about climate because i i i introduced the subject of green architecture and sustainability in buet in, in the masters uh, course so we we are having it for the last uh, when did we start i think it, we started introducing it 2012 it takes a process it goes through the academic council and everything and i think it was 2014 when we started actually delivering this so we have a lot of uh, masters of master of architecture students who take it and we go in depth about these climate issues about the energy issues but we always emphasize that you cannot forget the people because if you're not talking about participatory design you're really you know missing the uh, cue people are going to be living in your buildings if they can't understand your building then no matter how smart how efficient how technologically uh, you know advanced your building is they don't know how to use it so it's just completely useless it's just like you know manufacturers they come up with these um, uh, new gadgets every year right i i, I know because i work with um, a lot of um, lighting manufacturers and everything and uh, there are these you know really super efficient lighting systems that save so much energy but we know nothing about it because they're not going out and telling us about it so what's the point if i don't know that it exists what is where is this you know super efficiency going to actually be implemented unless i'm going to be implementing it so when we are designers we have to remember that we are really people who are going to make a change in people's lives so if we are going to be changing people's lives we have to understand those people we have to take them on board that change has to be uh, things that they want not something that we are going to impose on them okay there are many things that they might not want they don't understand these things what do we do if we think it's important enough then we have to educate them we have to make them aware and at the same time while we're doing that if we realize that they're not on board then we have to also adjust we can't say oh no that's right so you know you have to do it we cannot be that we are not dictators we are people who are um, designers are people who are giving options to users yes. and these options have to be attractive to the users they have to make a change in their lives they have to uh, be for the better if you can't do that then better not design just be an implementer somebody else else design that's also important everybody can't do it you have to realize what your potential is from the beginning if you can't be a designer if you cannot empathize with these people i leave it to people who can do it doesn't make you a worse person you must remember that just recognize your potentials and work according to that don't try to change yourself and you know and or think bad about yourself this is very important everybody every single person of us has good in us we are not bad people even the worst criminal you know in our religion uh, we cannot uh, condemn a person you can condemn the crime you cannot condemn the person so why would we think that that person is bad there's something in that person that can change so when we as you know young people get frustrated very easily just like they can get encouraged very easily they also get frustrated very easily so they you know depression sets in and then they think oh i have to i have to see the uh, you know culmination i have to end this there is no end it will go on ending something is not the answer 
everything is the beginning of something. There is no end to anything until maybe kiamat. But that also will, I hope, be the beginning for a better life for all of us. So there is no end, I think. Thank <laughs> you.